So the California Symphony, which is this orchestra based in Northern California, has asked me to write a new piece for May 2025. And they actually have asked me to also workshop the piece way in advance, which is something that doesn't really happen all that often. So I thought it would be interesting for me to do something that I don't normally do at all for this workshop session. So what I decided to do is write a piece for string orchestra. They gave me the exact string count. So I have 13 first violins, 11 second violins, nine violas, eight celli, and six contrabasses. So normally with a string orchestra, it doesn't really matter how many strings you have in each section, as long as it's pretty much evenly distributed. You, you usually like to have a few more of the higher strings, like the violins and the violas, than the cellos and the basses. But with the music that I write, I usually like to know exactly how many string players I'm working with, because oftentimes I write for each individual player in the string orchestra. So. I don't know if I'm gonna do the same thing with this exact piece, but I wanted to know exactly how many string instruments I'm working with. So they gave me this workshop schedule in January, 2024, to basically do whatever I want with this string orchestra piece. And today is September 29, 2023. So you can get an idea of how far in advance I work on these things. And I'm gonna show you a couple, a little bit of B-roll of what I'm working on here, but I did actually lie a little bit. I did actually start sketching some stuff yesterday just so I can be prepared for what I'm gonna say in this, <laughs> in this video. And uh, it was just one day of work. So what you see on the screen right now is just one day of work. Uh, not even one day, I would say maybe a couple hours of work trying to figure out what I wanna achieve with this piece. So you can see at the top here, what I basically did here is I just started writing out what are all the open strings on each of the string instruments. So for the violin, that's G, D, A, and E. So in other words, when you play on each of these strings without fingering anything, what is the pitch that you're gonna hear? So in that case, it's G, D, A, and E. Then what I did was I said, okay, what happens when I play the natural harmonics of each of these strings? So I wanted to do the natural harmonics that are the easiest to do on the instruments. So in that case, it's the natural harmonic that's one octave above the lowest note. The next one that's easiest above that is one octave and a fifth. And the one, the last one that I did is two octaves. So what I did is I outlined what are all the natural harmonics on each of the strings. So on the G string, you have G one octave up, then you have a fifth above that, which is the D, and then you have another fourth above that, which is the G. So I did this for every single string of every single string instrument in the orchestra, all the way down to the basses that you see over there. Okay, so why did I do this? Well, I'm trying to figure out a way to write a piece of string music that doesn't involve pressing down any notes on any of the strings. Louis Andreessen has a piece that's similar to this. I, I believe it's called Symphony for Open Strings where he actually detunes many of the strings on many of the string instruments in his little orchestra so that he can get way more pitches than just the open strings that regularly sound on the various string or instruments. So I thought it was a very interesting idea to apply in my music because I deal a lot with microtonal uh, inflected makamat music. So this technique that I'm describing is called scordatura which basically means detuning a regularly open string in a different way. So for example, that G string that I mentioned on the violin, I can detune that string down a semitone and get an F sharp. So when I play that G string, it doesn't sound like G anymore. It sounds like F sharp. And then you can imagine that the natural harmonics from that pitch would open up new possibilities. So instead of having G, D, G, like I outlined here, you would have F sharp, C sharp, F sharp. So you can imagine that if you apply this to microtones, imagine if you took that G and tuned it down to G half flat, right? Now you get a whole slew of new microtones. You'd get G half flat, D half flat, and then G half flat on the top staff. So this is very exciting for me because now I can achieve microtones in a way that's possibly naturally occurring on the instrument without the instrumentalist actually having to finger exactly where those microtones occur because as you can probably guess, when violinists and cellists and those sorts of instrumentalists are learning music from a young age and through the conservatory, they're not being trained at all really with how to play microtonal music. So by kind of eliminating the need to finger any notes, my hope is I can get these really nice resonating string chords 
out of the string orchestra by using this technique called scordatura. So my initial idea, I don't know how this is gonna change over time, but my initial idea is saying, okay, I have 13 plus 11 plus nine plus eight plus six instrumentalists. So that's give or take about 40, 45 players or so. Okay, I don't remember exactly how many. And I wanna divide the orchestra into three. So about 12, 13 players will have one set of scordatura that belongs to them. Then I have another 12 or so players have their own scordatura that's different than the first one. Then I have a third set of players that has their own scordatura different than the other two. So these are three pods of scordatura. These are gonna be three different sets of harmonies that I can play with. So if you look at the page here, I came up with two. I'm not sure what the third one would be yet, but I came up with two so far. So the first one you'll see is I based it off of what's called a C Ross scale. So C Ross scale, depending on how you actually interpret it, I interpreted it C, D, E half flat. So E half flat is the note exactly between E natural and E flat. Then I went up F, G, A, B half flat. B half flat would be the note exactly between B and B flat. So based on this scale that I want to follow, I changed the tuning of each of the strings so I can get all those pitches. So you look at the violin over here, the G, I had it stay the same. Then the D string, I moved it up to E half flat. The A string, I moved it down to G. And the E string, I moved it down to E half flat. So in this way, all the natural harmonics of all four of these strings match the pitches that are in that scale that I outlined. Moving down to the viola, I do the same thing. C stays the same, because that's part of the scale. G stays the same, because that's part of the scale. The D, I moved it down to C. And the A, I moved it down to G. And this, by the way, is an alto clef, so that's why it might look a little funky. It's an alto clef, but those are the pitches. They're the same ones from the scale I chose. Going down to the cello, the viola and the cello share the same exact open strings, but just the cello is down an octave. So this was really easy, I just basically copy pasted. So C is the same C on the bottom, just down an octave, then the G. Then I took the D string, put it down a step to C. Then I took the A string, put it down a step to G, and that's my cello. And then the contrabass, I use the open C string on the bottom. So if you take a contrabass, usually the open string on the very bottom is an E. But if you extend it down, you can extend it down all the way to C. So I wanted to use the C in this case because C is the tonic of the C Ross scale. I wanted to use that low C there. So I chose the C at the bottom. Then the A string would, be, would have been next. But instead of having A, I wanted to use G because G would be the fifth of the C Ross scale. I wanted to have a nice open fifth kind of sound. So I changed the A to a G. The next note would have been D. But instead of using D, I wanted to use C because that's the tonic of the C Ra scale. And then at the very top is G, and G is the fifth once again, so I can keep the G there without having any issues. So that's my first pod. I wanted to get this sonority that really replicates the C Ra scale. And then when I use the natural harmonics of each of these pitches, I can actually get this huge range of sound that covers the entire range of the C Ra scale, going down to the low, low octave, all the way up to the super high octave. So that's the first pod, that's like 12 people playing. Now the next pod, I decided to say, okay, I have the C scale where the third is down a quarter tone. Now what if I went up a major third to E? And to be honest with you, this is kind of random why I chose to go up a major third. I like thirds a lot, so that's really the reason why. So I went up a major third, I said, okay, let me start at E natural. And the other thing is E natural would clash nicely with the E half flat from the first pod. So I like to have a little bit of contrast there. So I said, okay, let me start with E natural, but instead of having the third be down a quarter tone like it is in the C Ra scale, let me use the Biati scale where the second is down a quarter tone from the F sharp. So if this was an E minor scale, let's say, that second note would have been an F sharp. But since we're in Biati, I move it down a quarter tone to F half sharp. So this is kind of the idea that I wanted to use. So we do the same thing. I say, okay, the violin is gonna be G, D, A, E, because all those pitches are in that scale. That was easy, okay? The next one, the viola, I decided to take the C on the bottom and move it down to B. I wanted to have more of that fifth sound. Then I did G, then I did D, then I did F half sharp at the very top. So instead of having an A, I move it down to F half sharp in the viola, 
And I do the same thing in the cello. I basically just copy the same score to Torah. Then at the very end, we have the bass. And the nice thing is I already have this open E string, so I use that on the bottom. Then I go to A, then I go to D, then I go to G. All four of those notes are already in that scale. So I wanted to keep this basically a tuning system that's very close to the Western tuning system. And then I said, okay, for the third part, I'll just keep going. I'll keep going up the third. This time I'll go to G. So G is my root. And then I went up the scale and I decided to use more of a Rost sensibility here-ish with the G, A, B half flat. But then I put a question mark. I said, I don't know if I want to do that again. Why? Because the B half flat and the E half flat that I'm using in this scale is basically identical to what I have going on in the first scale. So I don't know if that would sound different enough for it to warrant a third type of score to Torah. So that's where I am right now. This is day one. Day two, I'm looking back at my score here and I realize a few things. The first thing I realize is I have this scale here, C, D, E half flat, F, G, A, B half flat. And I realize that I don't have every single string represented in terms of the open strings on all the score to Torah tunings that I have on all the different string instruments. So what I decided to do is I decided to redo the score to Torah for that particular scale. So this is what's gonna happen a bunch of time. So even though you think you got it right the first time, you're gonna realize that you're gonna to have to redo things many times. So here I have C, D, E half flat, F, G, A, B half flat in the center of this manuscript. And I put these orange lines here just so I can see the new material I have going on here. And I decided to have the violin maintain the lower two strings. So I have G, D, A, E half flat. So I already have the E half flat there. I don't need to repeat it on the third string there like I did on day one. Then the viola, I have it going from C, G, D, A. And then I realized, well, I'm missing the F in the scale. And I can easily take that G and move it down one whole step. So now I re-edited it again. So now it's G, F, D, A. Then I go down to the cello. I say, well, the cello is the same as the viola, but down an octave. But I don't want the cello to be exactly the same as the viola. So what I decided to do is, well, I'm missing a B half flat from the scale. So I'm gonna take the low C of the cello and move it down one and a half steps to B half flat. And then I'm gonna keep all the other strings the same, G, D, and A. So those are all part of the same scale that I have here on the top. That's great. Now, I wanna kinda of go full circle here. So the very top string of the violin is E half flat, and the very bottom string of the contrabass is E natural usually. So I think it makes sense here to have that E down one quarter tone to E half flat. So I have E half flat, A, D, G. So this is what this all sounds like. So I take this collection of notes and I put it in logic or any DAW of your choice and I set it up as score to Torah number one. So you'll see here that I have score to Torah number one as track one in my logic pro system and the virtual instrument I chose is Pianotech. My, this is the software I'm using constantly. And you'll see here that I have everything already set up as far as the score to Torah goes. So if we start from the contra bass, I have your E flat that's up a quarter tone. Then I have my A, then I have my D and G. So those are gonna be my open strings. Then moving on up to the cello, it would be B half flat and then my G, D, A, and then going to my violas, C, F instead of G, D, which is normal. Sorry, I did that wrong. This should be the viola. Then I have my viola, C, F, D, A, and then lastly my violins, G, D, A, E half flat. So if I try to play everything together, it would kind of sound like this.
So I'm trying to basically create a brand new sonority here out of all these uh, different notes. So I'm happy with that. Then I went ahead and looked at my second row of notes here that I wrote on day one. And I just don't really like the sonority of this. Too many of the notes are too similar to my first set of notes and I want them to be as different as possible, I think, so I can get as many uh, different notes as I can. So instead of starting on the major third away from the C scale, which is the E, right? I decide, well, what if I just take the E half flat, the third of this original scale that I use and make that the root and then just go up the same intervallic structure that I was going up with my first iteration of that E scale. So you see here, I actually did that. So this would be E half flat, F, G half flat, A half flat, B half flat, C half flat, D half flat. So now you can see a lot of the notes are actually uh, very different. There's only three common tones, and that would be your E half flat, F, and your B half flat. Those are your only three common tones between the scales. Okay, so then I went ahead and I did the same thing. So I have a second group of scoratory strings now. So the violins would sound like this, G half flat, D half flat, A half flat, E half flat. So compare that now to the first set of scoratory, it was this. And again, your second scoratory. That top note is the only note that's the same. So now I have two contrasting groups of string scordatura, at least with the violins, okay? Now we get to the violas. The violas start with C half flat, F, D half flat, A half flat, okay? Contrast that to the scordatura one group. The violas were doing this. And the only note that was the same was this third string. So here's what Scordatura 2 sounded like again. Okay. Scordatura 1. Now the cellos, I tuned the C string down to B half flat, the G string down to G half flat, the D string down to D half flat, the A string down to A half flat. And we contrast that to our first scordatura. So we can hear the B half flat is the same in both of them. And lastly, we have the contrabasses. E half flat, A half flat, D half flat, G half flat. Contrast that with the first scordatura. So again, you have a common tone there, the E half flat on the very, very bottom. So to me now, I have a very distinct set of pitches in Scordatura 1 group and Scordatura 2 group, but that there's still maybe one common tone between the two groups of Scordatura so that I can create like kind of like, like you know how in functional harmony, when you're going from one key area to another key area, it's very difficult to do that unless you have some commonly related chord. So to me, my typical music theory training is really important when I'm working on things like this because I remember, okay, if I wanna go from one key area to another key area, it's gonna be much smoother if I do that with some kind of common chord or common tone. And that's what we learn uh, when we're learning four-part harmony. So even though that concept seems really foreign to this kind of music, I'm thinking about this actively as I'm going through these different sets of scordatura groups in the string orchestra. The very last thing I came up with today is I decided to take all these pitches and form a scale out of it to see what kind of sonorities I was getting if I put them all in a row diatonically. So this is the third piano tech instrument I came up with, which outlines all of the notes in the scale. So it is a 13 note scale actually. And I went ahead and started on C because I thought of this whole piece in C. So it doesn't really matter where I start, but I just started to start in C with this. So the first note here, C, D half flat, D natural, E half flat, E natural, F, F half sharp, G 
G half flat, G, A half flat, A natural, B half flat, C half flat, and then we're back at C again. So this is like a really densely chromatic scale. It actually kind of reminds me of, of Ivan Vichnagratsky, who was this uh, early 20th century Russian microtonal composer. And he wrote a lot of scales that actually sounded like this. So it was kind of by accident that I came up with this sound. So with this scale, I can create different cells out of it. So out of these pitches, I decided to make three note cellular patterns out of it based out of C. So this is just kind of random. I just thought to myself, well, what if I had every iteration of a three note scale starting from C? What would that sound like? So I got this. And I actually like that a lot. And to me, now I can improvise from that. So now after two sessions of writing, I feel like now I can start improvising based on all of this setup that I did for myself. So this way I can come up with a fresh palette of ideas and I'm not like already influenced by something that I might have done in the last piece or something that I've heard. I actually came up with these structures first and I said, okay, I'm gonna improvise based on a specific cellular pattern that I came up with from the structure. So again, I can start improvising with this cell in mind. So really the possibilities are infinite when you're working from a large scale structure and then going down, going down, going down. This is just the end of day two. I haven't written any music so far, but now I'm starting to figure out, okay, there are some things that I could do here that might apply to an entire piece.